Good morning, everyone. Bora Bhaub, a closer Kaniziki Digridia Hevu, and a warm welcome to today's event, where we'll be sharing findings from the research on the services and support available for older people at risk of or experiencing abuse, and what needs to happen to ensure that older people can get the help they need when they need it. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, there are over 150 of you with us this morning so far uh, from across Wales uh, and further afield, uh, representing uh, public bodies, the police, health services, local authorities, advice agencies, older people, a specialist service and others. So a warm welcome to you all. My name is Helene Herklotz, I'm the Older People's Commissioner for Wales, and I'm going to start uh, just with a, a few housekeeping notes um, for you. So first of all, you'll see that there is a Q&A box on your screen. So please do use that to post any questions that you would like uh, to ask the panel uh, in the discussion session later. So please do use the Q&A box for posting questions rather than the chat function. And you're welcome to post those in Welsh or in English. Now you can submit those questions anonymously. Uh, you'll need to uh, choose that option. Otherwise, your name will be flagged on the question. Just to let you all know that we are recording the event and it will be uh, available on the YouTube channel on our website uh, after, after this morning. And you can also find the summary of the research available on our website as well. So to start with, I'm going to um, go through a summary of the research findings uh, with a short PowerPoint presentation uh, to give you uh, an overview of what we found. So we commissioned this research from an organisation called Inside Out, which is Dr Norma Barry and Rian Bowen Davis. And I'd like to start by thanking them and paying tribute to all their work uh, for producing such excellent uh, evidence and thoughtfulness in terms of the report. The research was conducted between uh, November last year and January this year, and it covered the issues of abuse under the Valda SV definition of abuse and financial abuse as well. The research was shared with uh, myself as the Old People's Commissioner for Wales, and also our abuse steering group uh, and action group. And the research included a number of recommendations, which I'll reflect on later. The purpose of it was to undertake a comprehensive mapping exercise of the services throughout Wales to support older people experiencing or at risk of abuse, to identify the availability and types of services being delivered in Wales, and to consider whether the support currently available is sufficient to ensure older people can access the help they need when they need it. So if we could just pause the slides for a moment, please, because I think they're going slightly quicker uh, than I am. So uh, I'm just going to ask my colleague Kay just to go back to the slide on older people experiencing abuse. That's the one, thank you. That's the one, thank you. So it showed that um, there is a great deal of under-reporting of abuse and a lack of age-specific data. In other words, the data that records people who are experiencing abuse or who are using service is not broken down by age. And therefore it's difficult to assess how many people are experiencing abuse and how the services are meeting their need. What we do know, however, is that on average, older victims experience domestic abuse for twice as long as other age groups before seeking help. And there are a number of barriers that they encounter. Sometimes it's because of a lack of awareness of services or a feeling that the services are not for them. It may be shame or embarrassment 
or a fear of consequences. When we looked at the issue of financial abuse, we know that 50% of people over the age of 75 are targeted by scammers. And that's data from the national trading standards. Financial abuse, we know, can be committed by anyone. It might be a partner, a member of the family, a relative, or a criminal. And quite often, older people are experiencing a combination of different types of abuse. So what services are available? Well, in terms of Vowder SV services, what the research found was that services in principle are available for all adults, but they need to adapt and to improve their response to older people. The research found that there's a lack of older people's voices in the development of services and a failure to take account of their experiences. And very few services focus specifically on the needs of older people and older people with other protected characteristics, for example, older people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities can face additional barriers. So the report found that there's a need for appropriate accommodation and support services for those needing to leave abusive relationships. On the whole, that accommodation is not geared up to the needs of older people. Services also need to meet the needs of the diversity of the older population. One size does not fit all. The research found though, that there is some good practice in Wales, including Dowers Choice, uh, the OWLS service, the West Wales Domestic Abuse Service, and the Irish project, IRIS project in health boards, identification and referral to improve safety. So there's some really good practice to draw on and to spread. In terms of financial abuse services, quite a lot of these services are focused on uh, awareness raising campaigns, so getting information out to older people, providing training and signposting people where to go for help. But we found that the language that's used can actually affect the way a concern is dealt with. So whether it's called a scam, financial abuse or fraud may, may mean that different agencies are involved. So there's a lack of clarity for older people and not straightforward for older people to know where to go. And here again, the limitations on data collection, a lack of age breakdown on data collection inhibits the development of appropriate services. So good practice was identified, including the Financial Exploitation Safeguarding Scheme in Carmarthenshire. So moving on to some of the key recommendations that the research has highlighted. The first one is the importance now of reviewing and changing policies, procedures and services to ensure they are inclusive of older people, because at the moment they are not. Publicity campaigns on abuse also need to be inclusive of older people. And that means, for example, that the imagery includes older people, that the language is accessible for older people. So when people see those campaigns in the publicity, they can see people like them. And that information also needs to be available in community settings such as pharmacies and elsewhere. Data collection needs to be age related so that we can see clearly the circumstances for older people. Otherwise, people's experiences can be rendered invisible and the data that's needed for planning and service provision isn't there. And there needs to be a significant increase in training on the experiences and needs of older people across public bodies and voluntary organisations and government as well. So looking ahead now, we have some really positive opportunities and developments to respond to those recommendations and to take action. And the Welsh Government has already committed to an action plan to prevent abuse of older people that it started working on and intends to produce by the end of the year. So a fantastic opportunity to work with Welsh Government and to influence that. Welsh Government is also working on the development of a new Vowder SV strategy. So here again, there's the opportunity to be inclusive of older people and to make sure that that strategy delivers for all ages. 
And we ha now have the new Domestic Abuse Act for England and Wales, and also the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for England and Wales, who I'm delighted is joining us today. And finally, uh, as our contribution to some of the action that's needed, we have also launched a new services and support directory for Wales, uh, detailing what services and support are available across Wales. And that's available uh, on our website. And at the same time, we've produced a leaflet for older people, uh, for those who are not online. And finally, I'd like to say a thank you to the Stopping Abuse Action Group uh, and the Steering Group, over 30 organisations and older people who have been working with me uh, since March last year, showing fantastic commitment uh, to making change happen. And I do believe that we've got a very good opportunity now to seize the momentum and to work together to ensure we do all we can to prevent the abuse of older people and to make sure the right services are there for those who are at risk of or experiencing abuse. And our discussions today will focus on the action that we can all take. So without further ado, I'd like to move on now and give a warm welcome to Nicole Jacobs, who's uh, the new and first Domestic Abuse Commissioner for England and Wales. Nicole. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And um, I have to say, having met with Helena and her team uh, several times over the last year, very, very regularly and, and um, proactively uh, on the part of Helena, I just have to really welcome the report you've got in front of you. Um, and having read through it in some detail, you know, for those at Inside Out who helped prepare this report and for Helena and your team, I'm, I'm really truly, uh, it's a really impressive report in terms of just setting out in such clear detail, um, you know, the, the data, the gaps, our findings, um, the context in terms of strategy and the way that we might address um, improving services for older people. And I just have to say, it's an excellent report. Um, sometimes you see things in it and it, it leads you to question, well, where do we go from here? And there's, there's, this report is incredibly clear and I think will be such a useful document um, in a really practical sense for people who are wanting to promote and plan services, but also um, for policy reasons. Um, and it's something that we will use I hope you don't mind me saying not only in Wales, but certainly in England, I've already jotted down a, a few actions about how we, we, we would aim to use this report to influence well beyond Wales because it's such an incredible piece of work. So I really have to say that before I start. For those of you um, who may not have met me or seen me speak before, it's great to meet you. And, um, and as Helena said, I'm the new domestic abuse commissioner for England and Wales. And I say new slightly with a smile because I was appointed as a designate um, well over a year ago. And at the time, I think that, of course, we hadn't seen the context of COVID ahead of us. And certainly um, the feeling about the domestic abuse bill, which is now an act as of the end of April, or the end of um, last month, um, you know, we'd, we wouldn't have seen how long that piece of legislation will have taken um, to become an act. And so I have been working as a designate and now um, have the full powers of, of the commissioner and that sits partly in the Domestic Abuse Act. So the act creates my office um, and creates a statutory underpinning for the office, which gives us um, an ability to do two things, which I think are really important, both for this report and more generally in terms of a coordinated response to domestic abuse. It allows my office to um, seek data and information from public bodies, and there's a duty to cooperate. Um, and it also allows my office to make recommendations to public bodies that have to be responded to within 56 days. Um, obviously that remit in Wales is based on um, non-devolved issues. So particularly kind of justice system um, 
related issues. And in England, it would be the full remit of public bodies. And there's a lot of detail in the legislation that sets that out. But, but in general, um, in a lot of ways, my office is doing somewhat kind of the, the, the idea of what this report reflects about mapping provisions. So that's one of the key um, objectives of my office is to really make sure that we have a really good mapping of provision in both England and Wales. Um, because one of the things I have found, um, and certainly the report reflects this as well, is that when we're making decisions at a commissioning at nationally, um, UK wide, in terms of provision of support um, packages for, for survivors of domestic abuse, we're not always able to do that with the best information in front of us. Um, and so we really have to do an accurate mapping and that's for the whole family and for all of um, our protected characteristics and, and all of the above um, in terms of, of services. So what I mean by that is services for children, for adult survivors, for perpetrators to change. And this report is a really good example of, of how we can go about doing that. So that's something that my office will be doing much more broadly for all survivor services. Um, and we also will be and are doing policy work kind of across the board in all, um, in all areas. So health, housing, um, courts, uh, you, essentially domestic abuse, as you all will know, is one of those issues that there should be a thread of activity. And um, considering the prevalence quite um, prominent activity. And of course, in Wales, you have um, VAUDA SV, the Violence Against um, Women and Girls kind of framework for your legislation and services. And that's not out of sync in, in any way with the way I understand my office. So domestic abuse has huge overlap into stalking and harassment, sexual violence, um, so-called honor-based abuse, forced marriage. There's um, so many links. It, it's very hard in a lot of ways to, to, um, to address them in a different way. So I, I very much view what you're doing in Wales is, first of all, really groundbreaking um, and, and also um, a model of the kinds of ways that I'd like to kind of shape the policy work in our office. Um, we have practice and partnership leads sitting geographically um, and in England and covering Wales. Um, and so what we're trying to do is at the Domestic Abuse Commissioner's offices really have a very active um, engagement at the local level so that we know one excellent practice, which we see in this report, which I was very excited um, to read about. And I'd like to meet some of those services, obviously, and talk to them in more depth. Um, and also just understanding, again, where our local areas struggling with information um, that they may need and how can I use the powers of the office to really help um, local areas get to the information and data um, and good practice that they will want to know about um, or want to tell others about. So that gives you a really good sense of, um, of where, what we're, we're doing in the Domestic Abuse Commissioner's Office. Like Helena, my office is independent. So I've been appointed by government, um, however, we are independent of government. We both advise and will hold government to account. Um, and when I look at this report, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of things that haven't been said that I'll be certainly using this report and information to try to influence. So we've talked about um, the context in Wales, which is obviously incredibly important and your government is doing a lot um, in terms of really helping to improve some of these gaps in data and service provision um, in public awareness. It's really um, exciting to hear that they've got an action plan um, by the end of the year. And I'll be really keen to understand and help support that. Um, but, but also we have a couple of things that are, we'll be using this report to do. One is to influence the VOG, the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy and subsequent domestic abuse strategy for the UK government. Uh, or for the, for the um, government for England and Wales. Um, certainly that VOG strategy will have real important um, influence across government in <laughs> Westminster about how each and every department will be prioritizing these issues. So that is coming over the summer. 
very, very soon, I think we'll see um, Vogue's strategy and action plan. So I'll be making sure to highlight this report as soon as I possibly can. Um, and also thinking about um, the act, as Helena said, so we have the Domestic Abuse Act, which created my role. It did many, many other things. Um, probably too many to really outline in detail here. There's a lot of good information on the gov.uk website fact sheets about the act if you're interested. Um, but there are a couple of things that are, are will be really important. And one is influencing um, the, the, the new offense in the act of post-separation coercion and control. So it, up until the act passed, our, our offense of coercion and control was only applicable if you were in the relationship. And I remember really clearly an earlier event with Helena um, and Judy, I think, where we um, hadn't had this yet. And I remember desperately, um, you know, becoming very, very motivated to make sure that we did everything we could to convince government to adopt that change in the act, um, particularly after this event, because it was so clear to hear how much, um, particularly with financial abuse, you see that post-separation coercion and control um, and how important it's been. And the good news is we did have, we were successful and many people are, need to be credited for that, but we were successful in, in um, you know, persuading government to make that change. So we will now have that um, as part of a new offense. But the act has many, many um, things in terms of definition, improvement to the courts, um, new orders of protection, which will need to be piloted before they're fully implemented. So I guess the, the top line on the act is just to say there's, um, there's about, in my office, to give you an example, we have a spreadsheet of about 98 different items of implementation that this act brings. And they will all have varying implementation dates. And it's something that if you keep an eye on our website and keep an eye on our Twitter feed, we'll try to get those um, out in the public domain as soon as, as government does. Some of those deadlines are, are implementation dates are known and some um, need a bit more planning. So it's just something for us all to look out for. And the statutory guidance. And this is again where this report will be very influential. So um, in the summer, fairly soon, I think we'll see the, the statutory guidance that sits alongside the act come out for a final one, probably a few weeks, maybe about a month of public consultation. Um, and that will have a lot of provision in it in relation to housing, health, safeguarding, a lot of the types of um, changes we'd like to see or practice we would want to see that didn't necessarily need or sit in the Domestic Abuse Act. So that statutory guidance is really important and we, we will want to see, and I can tell you, I will be making sure that a lot of the content in this report is trying to, is getting into that statutory guidance document, which will influence so much practice. Um, a couple of other things before I close, I know I'll, I'm pushing my time probably a little bit, Helena, is also for us all to, to appreciate about the, um, the services for domestic abuse and wider violence against women and girls, also services for male victims, um, LGBT victims. There's a lot of gaps in our services and that would be in both England and Wales. And this report is really honest about that as it should be. Um, and uh, there's two really important ways, again, we'll use this report. One is with um, the victims funding strategy that the Ministry of Justice is working on for all victims of crime. Um, and very particularly focused on obviously domestic abuse, sexual violence. Um, and so getting this type of information into that funding strategy is a significant step forward to really helping um, bolster longer term funding, more provision of funding in these areas. And also one of the commitments that the government made during the passage of the Domestic Abuse Act was to formally consult on all community-based services in relation to domestic abuse. So this squarely sits in that 
um, piece of work too. That will start probably late this summer um, with the view that there could be potential um, amendments or, or inclusion in the victim's bill, which will be next year. Um, so I guess all of that to say, we have some very, very important um, and very busy times ahead of us to kind of use, use this type of work to influence um, so many other things in front of us. So just because we have the act um, already uh, passed, there's a lot of work for the implementation and a lot of work um, and opportunities that we'll be able to use and improve our services. And I certainly um, intend to do that. You have my full commitment. And again, um, all, all respect to Helena for really um, championing this issue and really raising awareness, changing the way our own crime um, surveys will be reporting on victimization and older for older people into the future. These are really, really significant steps ahead. And so I'm just so pleased to work alongside you with these um, things. So thank you very much. And, um, and I'm sorry, I can't stay for the whole of the, the event, but certainly if people have any questions, I'm really happy to address them as, as we go on. Thanks. Nicole, thanks so much and thanks uh, very much for your support and uh, we certainly look forward to uh, working uh, with you um, and great to hear about how you're going to use the report in your own work um, in, in England and, and Wales and I'm sure that some of the services that we mentioned as excellent practice would be delighted to meet you and to share uh, their learning and, and thoughts with you so thank you very much for that. So I'm going to move on now to um, invite Judy to uh, talk to us about her experiences as a survivor of domestic abuse. Um, and Judy is also a really valued member of our steering group um, and delighted to welcome you today, Judy. You're just on mute, Judy, so if you're just on mute. Right, so I'm going to talk about finding and accessing the right support from my perspective of a survivor of domestic abuse in my mid 60s. For well over 10 years, I experienced domestic abuse. For a long time, I didn't recognize it as domestic abuse. But for the last three and a half years, I sought help and tried desperately to escape. I lived in a very rural area of Southwest Wales. Before we moved there, he had been very supportive and charming. I left a very well-paid job, sold my house and invested everything in our new life in Wales, which was going to be the good life. We bought a six acre small holding and set up a business, renovated two holiday cottages, created a campsite and developed the small holding. But it wasn't long before my ex ceased to be Prince Charming and things steadily deteriorated. After a while, I realized I was doing everything, running the business, bookings, marketing, cleaning the cottages, sorting out the builders, shopping, cooking, cleaning, looking after the animals and going out to work. He wasn't doing anything and his control of my life was escalating. He criticized everything I did, the way I cooked, what I bought, what I wore, how I cleaned, how I managed the cottages and the small holding, everything I did was wrong. He wanted to know where I was, when I'd be back, what I was doing, etc. all the time. He disputed the money the business owed me, questioned the income from the business, but of course never helped with any of the bookkeeping. He moved things so I couldn't find them. He insulted me, swore at me, didn't speak to me for days on end, but in front of other people, he would be charming. And everyone thought he was wonderful. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to sell up and move away, but he told me there was no way he would ever, ever agree to sell. So I felt there was no option but to manage the situation as best I could, as I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't afford to just walk away with nothing at my age in my 60s. I became increasingly isolated. He made it very difficult for me to go away or for friends or family to visit. Being in a very rural location, it wasn't like I could just pop out and pop round to friends or people could pop in to see me. So the coercive control and threats of violence escalated. 
He was drinking heavily, which made matters worse. Whenever he threatened me, I told him I would call the police if he laid one finger on me. I locked my bedroom at night. Then eventually he did attack me physically. I called the police and he spent the night in the cells. I now started on the long road of trying to find and access to the right support to help me escape with my share of the proceeds of the property. So I'm now gonna go through the services that I accessed. Victim support. Victim support were great help. They phoned me just after the first visit from the police and did the DASH questionnaire with me, the first of many. And I was rated very high. They made me realize that this really was domestic abuse and that I needed to get out. They referred me to local domestic abuse services. The local domestic abuses, the local domestic abuse services help was a bit of a mixed bag. I repeatedly phoned them and left message until eventually I got to see one, someone from floating support. I only saw her a few times as it's meant to be short term support. I was signed off as there was nothing she could help me with unless I went into a refuge. She didn't seem to really understand my situation. I did not want to go into a refuge in my 60s and leave him in charge of the property, the business and all the animals. But they did refer me to a solicitor. Much later, they contacted me and suggested I attended the recovery toolkit. They were all much younger than me. And when I said I didn't feel the session on children was relevant, I was told if I didn't attend, I'd have to leave the course as I'd already missed one session when I had yet another punctured tire. It was a half hour drive to the venue and there was no public transport. However, they did uh, lend me an alarm, which I wore around my neck and for, for a while, although I then had to return it. Unfortunately, it didn't really work very well in that rural location because of the lack of GPS signal. They also allowed me to attend a few counselling sessions, but it was a very few because then the service was axed. Next, the solicitor. The, as I said, the domestic abuse referred me to a solicitor. She wrote to him, telling him to cooperate with the sale. She assured me it would all be over in three, mo three months, I'd get an order for sale and he'd pay all my legal costs. She was always really busy and never listened to me, but told me what would happen to me. Six months later, we had a court, talk, court hearing. My IDFA, uh, Independent Domestic Abuse Advisor, came with me and we asked my solicitor to, uh, to apply for a non-molestation order. At, but So I got the order to sell, but instead of getting a non-molestation order, I got an undertaking, an undertaking which told him to behave himself and not to become, not to come with, um, within one meter of the house where I was living. He had now moved into one of the holiday cottages, which was but a few feet away from my house. The solicitor refused to apply for legal costs or an occupation order. By now I'd paid my solicitor thousands of pounds and was no further forward. I was not eligible for legal aid because I owned my own home, albeit with him. He thought the court case was a big joke and taunted, it, taunted me with it later. I later discovered that he had a whole collection of identical undertakings from previous partners. Marek, I was referred to Marek approximately eight times and was allocated to IDFAs. The first one came to court with me and was really supportive. After the solicitor failed to get a non-molestation order and the police advised me that the undertaking was worthless as it was a civil order with no arresting powers, my IDFA helped me to apply for a non-molestation order on my own and again came to court with me. Although I was referred to Marek on all these occasions, I don't really know what the outcomes were, apart from being allocated in IFA. The judge, the judge was really oh, very unhelpful. He allowed my ex's solicitor to talk over me when I was trying to apply for the non-molestation order by myself, and then advised me to stick with my undertaking. 
My only op other option would be to apply for a full hearing with legal representation from a barrister, which she told me would be very, very expensive. Both the IDVAs allocated by Marek were really supportive, but they can only offer short-term crisis help. And I had to drive quite a long way to meet them. There didn't seem to be much they could do to help me apart from listen to me and support me. The council housing department. My second IDVA helped me to apply for housing and the council offered me a lovely little bungalow but I couldn't afford to accept it I was, as I was not eligible for housing benefit and only had a very small occupational pension. Plus it meant him leaving him in charge of the property and, and the sale of the property, which he wouldn't do. He obstructed the sale anyway. If I'd been younger, I would have walked away, but I couldn't start from scratch and leave the property which in, I invested my whole life savings in, in my 60s. My GP. My GP was very supportive and expressed concern about my physical and mental health. Her suggestion was that I took antidepressants and sleeping tablets. But I didn't want to take these. I needed to stay alert at all times, especially in the middle of the night. I asked for some counselling, but this never materialised. Long waiting list, apparently. My IDFA then referred me to Dowis Choice which specialises in support for older people. They were able to offer much longer term support. My Downers Choice, IDFA, tried to get the police to take action against my abuser and to install CCTV, but without any success. The project continued to support me throughout the whole three and a half year, the rest of the three and a half years. And they, the project themselves, installed CCTV in my property. They helped me to write an impact statement for the police, which was an enormous help, but the police never responded to the statement. They also came to a meeting I requested with the police domestic abuse team. When I did finally manage to sell the property, three and a half late, years later, they helped me to move. They were concerned that he would get out of control. So two Dowis Choice workers were with me while the removal guys loaded the van. They were right. He went ballistic and they protected me and called the police who stayed with him until I was gone. I don't know how I would have managed that day without their support. The police. I phoned 999 and 101 on numerous occasions. I can't even begin to count three and a half years worth. I really wanted the police to help to protect me and to hold him account, but my experience was very negative. They never sat down and listened to me or took me seriously. Sometimes they came out when I phoned 999 and spoke to him and then him, uh, spoke to me and then him. Sometimes they asked me to complete the DASH questionnaire, but not always. A couple of times I was asked to do the dash over the phone a few days later. I was frequently told this was a civil issue, it was not a police matter, and there was no evidence of a crime. I asked them to keep the diaries I've been keeping since the beginning of that first violent attack and to watch the CCTF evidence, talk to my family, neighbours, but they didn't. I even transcribed my diaries to make it easier for them, but they weren't interested. I tried to show them his X-file, he kept an X-file, which contained statements from his ex-partners about the domestic abuse they had experienced and all this collection of undertakings, but they said it was inadmissible evidence. I discovered there was a police domestic abuse unit, so I arranged a meeting with my IDVA, they said their role was not to investigate domestic abuse, but to refer victims to other agencies. And as I was refusing to go into a refuge, there was nothing they could do. They said it was not coercive control because we were no longer in an intimate sexual relationship. We hadn't been for years. His behavior had got worse since he moved into the holiday cottage 
He monitored everything I had did. I did attacked me, broke into the house, made my life hell. But when I told the police, he would tell, tell the police I was mad and he was a poor, innocent victim. The police seemed to believe him, not me. There was one local police officer who tried to help me and he seemed to understand, but then he went off on long-term sick. I hope I wasn't the cause. I asked my access report from the police, which was really upsetting. There were lots of incidents missing, including the time when he tried to strangle me. And it proved they never believed me. It said things like, there's no evidence of crime. This is a civil issue. She exaggerates. She didn't sound very upset. My ex has never been held to account and is no doubt out there now abusing some other woman. So to conclude, I found it very hard to find and access the right support that was appropriate for a woman in her 60s in a very rural location. There was nothing close by. Everything was at least a half hour drive away. Domestic abuse, especially coercive control, is complicated and is even more so if you're an older woman, you own your own property and a business in common and live in a very rural location. Thankfully, in September 2019, 19, sorry, September 2019, I finally escaped. I've moved somewhere new and I'm trying to rebuild my life from scratch. Very few people, including my family, know where I am. I still have nightmares, but I am free. Thank you. Judy. Thank you so much uh, for what a powerful uh, and courageous account of everything that you've been through. And I think together with the evidence from the report, we got a very strong sense of what needs to change so that people don't have to go through what you've gone through. I should also add that um, I'm incredibly thankful to Judy for all the support that she is giving me and the steering group in the work that we're doing. It's so important to have survivors' voices at the heart of that. So Judy, thank you. I'm sure everybody watching would be applauding you right now, um, if, if only we were uh, be able to be uh, together. But thank you so much for that um, and for all that you are doing uh, to help other people um, who are in the same situation or indeed to prevent them being in that situation. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to the panel discussion. Uh, and this gives you a chance to pose your questions uh, and your thoughts. And we've already had some of those, so keep them coming into the question and, and answer uh, section. And uh, delighted to welcome our, our panel today. Thanks so much for joining us. So we have um, Albert Heaney, who's the Deputy Director General for Health and Social Services at Welsh Government. Um, thank you, Albert, for, for joining us. Um, Anne Williams, who's the manager of the Live Fear Free Helpline and Rachel Nicholson, who's Director of Performance and Partnerships at Hourglass and Director of Hourglass Cymru. So a fantastic panel. Thank you all very much for, for joining us. So I'm just going to start really with a, with a general question for, for you all, and then we'll start um, picking up the questions that people are, are, are sending in. Um, Albert, if I could start with you really, just to get your reflections on, on what you've heard uh, on the report and your thoughts on the action that we can take in the future. Yeah, Tilk, thank you, um, Alina. Um, uh, Bordar, um, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm Frank Tack and Blacker, Carl Bordar, I have you. Uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be here today. Um, just to say at the outset, uh, I thought, uh, thank you, thank you, Judy. Um, really, you know, really brave, really courageous, and inspiring uh, to hear. Um, in terms of your account, what's happened, and actually alongside this report today, then I think my, my first impression for us all are the things that we need to 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 learn uh, and to work together to do differently, um, to use that inspiration in a way to drive us, you know, to transform and to change. I think there's some things in Wales we should be pleased about our starting position. I think it's fabulous to have an older people's commissioner championing, um, protecting, um, you know, influencing. Um, uh, we were the first uh, of the UK countries to um, to um, 
you know, um, have an older people's commissioner. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, this report today, um, the work that you've done, Helena and your team uh, to produce this report is absolutely, you know, fantastic. Um, within the report, I think there are so many lessons to be learned and it's really upon us all uh, to work together, um, you know, to review um, and to importantly, to, to be brave and change where we need to change to serve people and protect people differently. I think it's interesting when we look at protection colleagues that, and support um, that sometimes, you know, over the years, it's taken a, a time to, to, to get the learning together and this report brings it into one place. Um, so, you know, I think it's excellent for to have own influence. I think there are some layers that we need to work on as well. We need to think about the roles of the National Independent Safeguarding Board and the local statutory safeguarding boards and how they and the partner organizations can work together differently. I think that, that that's the type of opportunity colleagues for Judy Judy's story to, to be alive with police colleagues and others around those tables to, to really make a, a, a meaningful difference. Um, for me, um, this will uh, drive um, the conversations that I will be working on within the government and working with partners. Um, I do believe that protecting older people is everyone's responsibility. Uh, we all share that and we should all deliver together. And part of, of changing the way we think as a culture, as a, as a, as a community, is to um, really develop our forthcoming, as, as uh, Helena mentioned in her opening, um, strategy a strategy for an aging society. Um, you know, we are absolutely committed to um, uh, preventing uh, abuse of older people. And you know, we'll now be looking to learn from, from this uh, and to learn from yourselves so that the action plan that we develop together um, you know, serves older people well in Wales. And in the report, you know, I think it's a really hard hitting report actually. I think um, you know, it, 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 it's emotional. Um, you know, it really connects. Um, you know, when I look at um, just a, a few headlines, and I won't stay on forever, Lena. I will. I promise to stop talking at some point. But uh, you know, scammers. Um, you know, it's just it's 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 atrocious. It's shocking. It's reprehensible. And we've got to, you've really got to address those issues. When you look at the average age of a person being 75 as a victim, and the oldest person being 108 you know, that really strikes home. Um, for me, it strikes home. And I think, um, you know, therefore, there are key points. Um, data is another issue that uh, Helena and I've spoken about, and we really need from this report to drive forward and improve the way we collect data and the type of data we collect that therefore can enable us to make better choices, better decisions. Um, Judy spoke eloquently in terms of uh, accommodation issues, and I think we're at the beginning of a journey of thinking differently around, you know, violence against women um, in terms of accommodation solutions. I think traditional approaches haven't been necessarily a good fit for for people of a, of an older older age group, uh, and therefore we do need to think differently. I think we've begun that journey. I think it's helpful you know, to see recently some of the different thinking taking place. Uh, there was some monies made available for capital funding, um, you know, for dispersed community-based appropriate accommodation. And I think for the first time, you know, we've really begun to look at that and think about that in terms of, you know, being accessible for older, older victims of abuse. Um, and I think this is exactly the, the direction that we need to travel in. Um, we have a wonderful opportunity coming up in terms of the, of the review of our strategy in, in uh, relation to VIDA SV, and I think that's a good, good place to really drive forward. And I think my, my concluding opening comment really, you know, I, I'm committed. I, I want us all to be committed together. You know, it's absolutely, you know, learning from this report, learning from, from feedback, learning from the, the views of Judy uh, and other victims um, to explore everything we can do within the report, all the findings, all the recommendations. But more importantly, we must now work to take the action required, uh, listening to your views, the ways to transform services, you know, uh, for people, supporting people. Uh, who are experiencing abuse and, and provide the right support 
at the right time to to make Wales that place that uh, the older people's commissioner wants to see and we want to see um you know um the best the best country for people to grow old uh, thank you helena oh, Calvert, thank you very much indeed and uh, thanks so much for your commitment uh, to this and um i think some some really helpful uh, reflections there about working with the National Independent Safeguarding Board and others on, on taking some of these things forward. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to come now to um, Anne for, for your reflections and, and thoughts on the action that we need to take. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be present today. You've given me a huge task, Helena, um, in giving an overview in a couple of minutes. I am a Welsh woman and we like to talk. Um, I think my uh, message uh, is the fact that we need education and training, that's without a doubt, not only for organisations and agencies, but if we are putting the message over, it's for all society. And when people within our communities are looking for support, that they know where these agencies are. Judy, you mentioned... Um, the fact that there was a police officer who um, spoke to you and he had what you said was an understanding of the situation. Shouldn't that be the norm rather than the exception that everybody who you should have come into contact with would have had that level of understanding? Um, and also, I think we need to be thinking about who is the older person? You know, do we have a tendency to think that they are the very older within our societies? Um, again, um, you know, it's the possibly the younger end as well. Judy, you said that you were in your 60s, obviously a very capable uh, woman. Do these women sometimes present, you know, um, as being capable and completely able to take charge of their own affairs? Um, you know, when that person sits in front of somebody in an agency, are they then seen to be a person who can cope? That person is also classed as, a, as, a, as an older person. Um, the Valda SV Act defines the range of abuse. And, you know, that includes domestic abuse, sexual violence, coercive control, financial abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Do we always um, take sexual violence and sexual abuse, sexual harassment of the older person uh, into account? Um, you know, yes, we acknowledge domestic abuse, but sexual violence also takes a place within this age group. And I think it's really important that we do not lose sight of that. Um, I have talked about training and education and also a great awareness of who can help. Who are these agencies? Where are they? Um, I manage a, a national helpline, so it's really important that we have this database and that it's current and up to date. And at the touch of a switch, we can access information. I think also the report mentions the fact that it takes twice as long for an older person to make that disclosure. If they made that disclosure at three o'clock in the afternoon, where is their support for that person at 3 a.m. in the morning? That disclosure is hard enough to make. Now, if they've been sent away, you know, yes, you will be seen in a week or a fortnight. That person is carrying that around. They will not be sleeping that night. Do they know about the national helplines? So it's about that awareness racing of all agencies that we should all be offering that wraparound support for these people. And again, um, you know, I've mentioned the fact that I do manage the National Helpline. We have seen during the pandemic, and I, and I will probably address this in, in my closing remarks, but we have seen all protected characteristics. You know, the, the numbers have increased during the pandemic. We are not out of the woods. I think all this talking about the easement of restrictions, we are only skimming the surface of problems. We have seen uh, during the, the lockdown that older people have come forward, male and female, they are increasing in numbers. It's not just partner abuse, it is financial abuse. It's also child to parents or child to grandparents. All types of abuse are there. And unfortunately they are thriving. 
Uh, thank you very much in, in, indeed for your reflections. And I think also for just reiterating that the current sort of situation that we're in actually with increasing numbers of people coming forward and, and important also to, to reflect the issue about older men as victims of abuse. And I know we've got a few questions on that, which we will, we will come to in, in a while. Um, and thanks also for all you're doing um, to raise awareness and, and to train. Really important work. Thank you, Anne. So I'd like to invite um, Rachel now. Rachel is the Director of Algas Cymru uh, for your reflections, Rachel. Thank you, Helena, and thank you for inviting us here today. Um, I think it was really interesting what Judy said about the fact that when she engaged with Dareth's Choice, i.e. a specialist service for older people, that she got the help that she really needed. And that's what the report has shown, that there's a huge lack of services within Wales. Um, and obviously that's something that we, with the Welsh Government and with the Stopping um, Abuse Action Group, we can work together to, to try and provide those services for older people. But it's about getting older people there in the first place. And we know there's a huge lack of, um, of reporting of abuse of older people. And a lot of that comes from a lack of awareness. Now, the, the, we don't know because of a lack of data how many older people are being abused in Wales. And that's physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, um, neglect, as well as coercive control. And that's abuse against women and men. Um, a quarter of the people that contact our helpline are men, and that number is increasing. But what we do know from um, a polling um, survey that we did um, in 2020, uh, the results are that one in five people in Wales are experiencing, older people in Wales experiencing abuse. So that could be anywhere up to 170,000 older people experiencing some form of abuse. Yet we know there is nowhere near that amount of figures within services. Um, or reporting to the police or, or, or even social services. And what we also found was that one in five people in Wales don't know what to do if they suspect abuse is happening and it's taking place. And that's what's really worrying, that people could be abused, but we don't know what the signs are. We don't know the indicators of abuse. And often older people, particularly those who've been experiencing abuse for decades, don't know that that's what it is. And also, you know, we work under strategies that do lend themselves to, to older women or to women and, and not so much older women, but are aimed particularly at women. And there is a, a reason for that. Um, but it's not just intimate partner violence that we're dealing with. Um, according to our figures, um, over a third of the perpetrators are actually adult sons and daughters and it's violence that's taking place within a, um, a family setting when we look at older people and actually partners only only amount to 12% of, of the perpetrators. And I could bore you with statistics, I don't really want to do that, but it's what is important is this lack of awareness. And we know that, that um, we at Hourglass have provided, in fact, Heart of the Press today will be uh, booklets on every type of abuse aimed at older people and those concerned about an older person so that we start talking about abuse in all layers of society at the top and decision makers and influencers, but also uh, in the wider public um, so that we can get people to that stage but then we must have those services in place to support them and I appreciate the time strange so I Rachel, lovely Rachel thanks so much and I think very powerful statistics um, and for those of you who don't know our glass it's a, it's a specialist organization for all the people who might be at risk of or experiencing um, abuse and, and Rachel's been working uh, as part of our uh, steering group as well um, doing fantastic work and I think really important that statistic about people not knowing what to do and obviously that's partly why we're producing information and also the, the services directory. So I want to come on to the questions that are coming in now and, and to start with that issue about um, the experiences of older men and a number of you have, have raised that in questions and um, the research did look at this and in, in um, finding that there weren't the services really geared up to older people uh, that was dubbed even more so for, for older men uh, and we know also that um, as we get older, uh, it's more likely that, that men might, might experience abuse than when they are younger. So it's a real big issue here. Um, as, a, uh, as the Old People's Commissioner for Wales, uh, I've already committed to um, commission some work on the experiences of older men at risk of or experiencing abuse. Uh, this year, I'll be working with the um, abuse steering group on that. So um, we think there is more work to do to really uncover experiences and to look at what needs to uh, happen. But ahead of that, I'd really like to ask the panel for your thoughts on what, what more can be done to 
um, support older men, both in coming forward uh, and also in terms of the response uh, that they receive. And, and Rachel, can I come to you first on, on that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, as I said, I mean, a lot of it's about raising awareness. And we know that um, there's underreporting, but there is underreporting, particularly in older men, and there are specific barriers to old, for older men. And a lot of that comes from shame and embarrassment. But also the imagery for any services, there's there's obviously a lack of, of imagery around older people in general, but particularly older men. And I know it's something that I'm very particular about when we when we do anything, that there are images of older men when we look at domestic abuse. Um, as far as, I mean, the fact that you've been, um, you're, you're doing the research and the, the, the action group is looking at this is, is paramount. Um, as part of the action group, obviously, um, via you, I sit on the VAD SV strategy um, groups and we are always raising, well, I say we, I'm, I'm always raising, as others are, the, the issue of older men as we look at developing that strategy. So I'm hopeful that that message is getting out there at all levels. Thanks, Rachel. And you mentioned you were getting more calls from, from men now onto the Live Fear Free helpline. Yes, we, we are, um, Helena, but we also, I'm going to reiterate again what um, Rachel's just said. I think it's about raising that awareness. And if we don't raise that awareness, then obviously, you know, we won't get those calls in. Um, when I, in, I would say in the last six months, the demand to have awareness sessions for various agencies and, and um, organisations have increase tenfold to the helpline and it's about getting that message out every time in every awareness session you know that we when we talk about the victim it is absolutely everybody because because there's the, the, the you know it is a um a cross-gender uh issue so we make no differentiation whatsoever somebody presents you know um with um this issue with the helpline and they are supported fully we also have to obviously take into account uh, that uh, uh, many people now contact us um, either via uh, web chat, text or um, email. So we don't always know either uh, whether they are uh, male or female. So like I say, the, the service is given across the board. And thank you very much for that. I'm just aware that Nicole has to leave us now. So I just wanted to say a final, uh, thank you very much, Nicole, and look forward to, to working with you further. Thank you. I was really interested in those last comments. So I'm so glad um, the panel's been able to address that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. And Albert, any, any reflections, Albert, on this issue of support for older men and, and increasing awareness? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I agree with the comments of um, Anne and Rachel this morning. Um, I, I think that there's a couple of reflections. Like one is that I think as as a man, men, we, we, we sometimes struggle to share things um, that can be, as you said, for shame or embarrassment, but kind of some of it is almost deep rooted into childhood and upbringing. And so there's something about new messaging, there's new stories, there's new awareness. So there's something in, in, in promoting, and I think imagery is one way of promoting, but I think there are other things about thinking about what it means in our culture, you know, what it means in our culture now to be an older man and when you're at risk and you're vulnerable and you're, uh, and you're really isolated because, you know, you're, you're alone in that trauma and that experience, then, then we have to find new ways of reaching out. I think one way of doing that is through thinking about our approach as a nation in terms of, of, of awareness campaigns. I think alongside that then is about our training and our practice. So at another level, I think it's the way we engage because that first point of contact when someone wishes to speak out and tell their story is so crucial that they get the right support and the right messaging and the right, you know, enabling conversations at that time as well. So I think there's a lot to do with both strategy, but then getting into really thinking about our practice and, and the importance of those conversations and supporting and enabling conversations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Albert, for that. Um, another question has come through um, about uh, coercive control. It says that many older people are not clear on what coercive control means. Many have lived this way for perhaps 30 years or more and have accepted this as the way of life for them. It's a huge step for them to leave and accept that they've been abused all these years. How do we reach these people who perhaps are not fully aware that life doesn't have to be this way? I mean, I'd like to um, ask the panel that, but I'm also going to bring in Judy on that question in a moment, if I may, Judy, because I'm sure you might have some reflections on, on that. So um, anyone on the panel want to come in on that one? 
I, I mean, I think it just comes back to awareness raising again, that, um, you know, if we can't reach people themselves, um, then it's about their family, friends, neighbours, anybody around them, GPs, pharmacists, people they visit regularly, um, librarians, well, when you've got transport to get there and if they're open still, um, those or it's accessing all those different layers of, of engagement that older people can come into contact with and then being aware as well of, of what can always control um, looks like with, with simple language and language with easy to under exam and easy to understand examples. Um, but we know that, you know, and Judy was saying earlier about being in a rural location, it's very difficult to reach out to to, to older people and particularly older people that maybe don't normally engage with organisations um and we have to find a way that we um those communities aren't hard to reach we're not reaching hard enough and it's it's and it's working together with partners to get to 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 people to to for them to be aware of, of what might be happening to them thanks Rachel. i think i mean that, that point about rural communities is an important one as well and it came up in the research actually that services are even more difficult to access if you're living in a rural area and also issues about um services in the welsh language as well um, more to do there. But Judy, just any reflections on this issue around, you know, people living with something for so long, not knowing it's called coercive control or just it's become the way of life, really? Yes. And I mean, that's it wasn't until Victim Support did the, the Dash questionnaire and asked me all these questions and then thinking about it afterwards. And I'm not really, I'm never having spoken to anyone because everyone thought he was so wonderful. Yeah. Because in front of everyone, he was so wonderful. And I was the one that was the abusive one, according to him. And, and it is really hard. I mean, I, I thought, you know, I'm an intelligent woman. I was a university lecturer. I thought I understood about, you know, domestic abuse. <laughs> I even taught people coming out of <laughs> domestic abuse situations. And yet I... I didn't recognise, didn't recognise it in myself, didn't recognise coercive control and really didn't understand it until I, when I saw the counsellor for that short few, ses few sessions, she gave me, one, she gave me some, a leaflet about gaslighting, never heard of it. And it was sort of, oh my God, this describes my life. And mm. then she told me about Evan Starks and I listened to Evan Starks on YouTube and thought, that's my life. That's my life. And that's been my life for a long time. And so how you get other people to recognise that, you've got to make all of that available. And, yeah. and it shows the importance of the, the right person asking you the right questions to sort of enable you to share that and, and stop and, and think. But also that we need to be careful about the language that we maybe all use, but isn't, isn't language that is necessarily uh recognized more widely and he wants to come in on that yeah let's not forget either the power of the soaps you know these stories crop up in the soaps and if they are done effectively and show coercive control for what it really is not just to have it you know over three episodes and then it's all sorted like judy said it's a gradual process. Mm. Have this story developed over a year, two years, because that's real life. Mm. And it's not always sorted by one phone call to the police. What about the other agencies? So I think, you know, whenever these stories are highlighted, you know, in, in, um, in, in the soaps or, or other TV programmes, then that they are done um, effectively yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good point, actually, isn't it, about that, just making this, it's about awareness, isn't it, that, uh, and an understanding. Did, Albert, did you want to come in on this question as well? Yeah, yeah, I could just, just briefly, because there, there, there's a couple of things that, that struck me. One is that, you know, people, we don't really understand, most of us, what coercive control is. You know, in terms of the experience, the lived experience. So, so that is important that we describe that. I think alongside that, there's got to be. So, the soaps is a good way of doing that. But I think alongside that, you know, we've got to be really clear in our campaigns about rights, entitlements, the right and entitlement to be respected, to be safe. 
you know, uh, and, and in any relationship, and what's unacceptable, you know, is obviously the flip of that. But we've got to get into that and, and really, you know, as a society, as a culture, be clear, this is how we live in Wales and what we expect. And, and that's the, today's generations, but also future generations. There is a question I have, Helena, maybe today is not for the answering of that question, but, but often we talk about, and I understand why, you know, the, the, the victim having to leave and how do we support the victim in leaving. But I still have a question in my head about, you know, should the victim have to leave and should we be thinking differently in society about the protections about people? Because you're not just making a choice to leave, you know, it, you're losing, as, as you describe, you're losing your, 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 your livelihood, all of the things that matter to you alongside that. And that's tremendous. So it's just a question. I think it's one that we should explore and debate and look at where we, we need to strengthen. And then the the, the, the last one was maybe it's a question in itself. You know, I think we think about those relationships, but clearly this research is also showing around financial abuse from, you know, siblings, um, you know, from sons, daughters, from other family members. And so there's something really big here to be clear about because, you know, that financial abuse is an extraordinary big problem uh, for older people and one that we have a responsibility really to grab hold of and, and do something, uh, do something um, supportive around. No, I, I agree. And uh, neatly done where the panel members are now asking questions as well. So uh, we're getting into a good, a good debate there. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I completely agree about financial abuse. And that's why <clears throat> it's really important that the research <clears throat> covered it um, because it has such a big impact on all the people. And we know, for example, that you know, you're more likely to feel that you need to go into a care home if you've been financially abused because it really shocks you it can shock you to the core it can really threaten your independence um, and the point about <clears throat> having to leave um, brings me on to the whole question around uh, accommodation actually we did do some work on that last year and um, I think we would all echo that view that it shouldn't always be about the person who's a victim having to leave if it's what they want to do and they feel that's the best decision absolutely right but it's also about the removal of the perpetrator um, so we have done work on how we can improve uh, accommodation support, <clears throat> and I know a lot of housing organisations are, are looking at that now, which is great. Um, I'm going to take a glass of water actually in a moment because you hear my, uh, I've been a little bit croaky, but I want to um, ask a question, uh, particularly uh, about um, the police actually, because that's come up as, a, as an issue. Um, and, you know, why, why you feel maybe the police um, didn't act as quickly as they could have done in, in Judy's situation. But how are things changing at the moment? We know that the police are very much involved in, in our action group and they're doing some very good work there. So um, maybe Anne, you, you probably uh, work quite closely with the police. So any, any thoughts on, on what's happening there and the developments there? Yeah, we, um, we have been working uh, closely with the police over the last, especially I would say the last 12 months. So we, we've got an initiative going with South Wales Police and that started in November, where the police officer um, attending any incident of domestic abuse will promote the helpline. Um, and if needs be, if that person's, you know, the victim's phone has been taken away or smashed, will offer uh, the use of their own phone for that immediate contact if, if required. Um, I am also delivering uh, lots of awareness sessions at the moment to uh, the police forces. Um, I've worked quite closely with Mike Taggart from North Wales Police in, in delivering um, awareness sessions to people in the beauty industry and in the barbering and, and uh, hairdressers, because we know, you know, these people are in close contact on a one-to-one -one basis with with um, with the victims, so it's about raising that awareness to all police officers. We know that now they have you know domestic abuse champions within their forces, and those are being trained. So I would say you know small steps, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, I think what's happening for me is to see the eagerness, yeah, to see people being engaged and wanting to understand you know the full remit of, of of what domestic abuse is so yes i think we need to take heart 
Thanks, Sam. And I, I would completely agree. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's terrific working with uh, police forces as part of that action group. And I think that eagerness is, is definitely there. I want to come back actually to this issue of financial abuse and come to Rachel on this one, because it must be something that comes up a lot in your work. And just wondering what more can we do to highlight the issues and to, to enable people to get the support um, if, it, if it happens to them? I mean, it does come up, um, but based on our helpline figures, it, it's normally the highest, um, um, it's high prevalence of abuse, is financial abuse. Although last year, actually, psychological abuse took over from that. Um, I think... I think there's an awful lot that we've done on scams over the years. Um, we used to have the Wales Against Scams Partnership, and I haven't heard much about that in, in recent times. Um, but I also think, particularly for older people, there's there's more that can be done about the wider financial abuse and financial abuse that's taking place where, and I think Albert mentioned it earlier, where um, where grandchildren are stealing from their their um, relatives, where wills are being changed, where pounds of attorney are being abused. Uh, where savings have been emptied and pensions have been claimed. It's such a wider issue than just someone, uh, than just scams, which obviously have a huge impact on older people. So I think it is looking at the impacts, as you said, about, um, you know, the, the consequences of, of, of what can happen when um, some of these life savings are taken from them. Um, but also making people aware. And again, it does come back to awareness, but backed up by services and action um, that actually somebody uh, making you change your will is financial abuse. Somebody um, keeping more money after they've gone for the shopping is financial abuse. Um, and, you know, and we, we, we've one of our, we have a specific financial abuse leaflet and we offer advice on our helpline. But, you know, I, I know that age, can we do some work around this as do other organisations? So it's something that a lot of us are, are working on and I think continuing forward the, the, the pandemic has seen organizations being brought together uh, really well the stopping um, abuse action group is, is one age alliance is, is another and we have to continue going forward working with trading standards um, and other um, um, organizations um, to, 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 to strategize together and work together to, to, to address this. I would, I would agree. And I think, um, you know, that the way in which so many organisations are now working together and it's been, yeah, national training standards and, and others. Um, and as Anne was saying earlier, that kind of eagerness of, of taking action. We've had a question also um, in about um, people living with dementia and their carers and the, the particular vulnerability there to um, abuse and just, a, you know, what, what can particularly be done there? And I wondered, Albert, if this might be something um, you might have some thoughts on. I know, the Welsh Government's done a huge amount on, on support for people living with dementia, and, um, but this issue about where, where abuse and dementia can, can go together. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, this is such an important point. Um, I, I think that the first thing I would say is I, I think there's got to be a range of support services around people with dementia. And some of that, I think, is shown to be proven when it has advocacy. And those good. I, I hope I'm still online because everybody else is frozen at the moment, and I can't tell if I'm still on. So uh, uh, I'll on. just pause. And if you, I am still on. We're still Thank on. You. We can hear you, Albert. Yeah. Excellent. That's good. Thank you. And I think really, uh, I would be citing, you know, dementia advocacy projects. You know, providing support, independence. You know, that kind of professional advocacy to older people you know and and i think it's 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 also then leads you into you know how do you support people with dementia but support the carers around them in terms of recognizing when things are are uh, abusive um and uh, and taking taking a course uh, of the wrong direction and you know certainly in the welsh government we'll be looking at funding you know some of the dementia advocacy right up until the end of 2022 i think there's a couple of other things i'd like to to, to raise related i think when you think about dementia there are so many sometimes services and agencies involved so we just need to make sure that they're all you know aiming and, and doing the, the right action so for example you know some of our health colleagues will have a big role to play and i think you know you've got real opportunity there um helena uh, was some of the wealth of, of knowledge and experience. If if they're able to respond early and, and identify early, then we can make um, some you know uh, joined uh, up interventions that can be supportive and enabling people to be safe and protected. Thank you very much, Albert. So final question for the panel before I ask for your concluding remarks. And this is 
What one message would you give to any domestic abuse organisation working now across Wales when working with older people? So what one message would you give to any domestic abuse organisation working now across Wales when working with older people? I'm going to ask Judy that one as well, just to give you a heads up to you. I'll come to, come to you in a moment, but maybe if I could start with Rachel. Any one message? I think it would be to um, ensure that everybody working for the organisation is aware of the specific risks and indicators and impact of domestic abuse on older people. Lovely, thank you. And succinct as well. Brilliant. Uh, Anne? I would say listen to what's being said to you and don't dismiss it out of hand. Explore a little bit. Don't just take that the person sitting in front of you is possibly ill, disabled or has dementia. What else is going on in that relationship or household? Thank you. And Albert? Yeah, thank you. Uh, firstly, keep up the good work uh, and listen and learn from uh, this report, from the information and from the experience and the lived experience of, of people. Lovely. Thank you, Albert. And Judy, what one message would you have? Well, Anne's taken mine. I was going to say, <laughs> take time to listen. And it's, it's not short term. Yeah. You know, so many of the services I encountered I was told could offer short-term crisis help. What I needed, and eventually found with Dara's Choice, thankfully, is long-term and taking time to listen and offer long-term support, not just crisis intervention. Thank you very much, Judy. So we've just got a few minutes uh, left now, and um, I'm sorry if I didn't get through all the questions. I tried to get through as many as possible that were coming in, but I want to give every member of the panel now uh, really an opportunity just for any uh, concluding comments and I would also like to offer Judy an opportunity for any concluding comments having heard the questions and the debate having heard from Nicole uh, earlier as well so I'm going to come first to Anne then to Albert then to Rachel then to Judy so Anne if I can come to you first please. Um, I, I think again I'm taking heart from the number of participants in the webinar today uh, we're still on 175 and, um, you know, that's testament itself that people want to help, want to learn. Um, of course, um, no meeting where I'm present uh, would pass without me uh, promoting the Live Fear Free Helpline. We are there 24-7, 365 days a year and not just for, for the victim themselves, but please as professionals as well. If you're presented with somebody and you're not quite sure what to do, then pick up the phone. We're always there and we will support you and, and the person that you've got sitting in front of you as fully as we can. And that's lovely. Thank you very much, Albert. Yeah, I, I'm keen, um, colleagues, to, to listen and learn from the participants on this call today and then to use that knowledge and experiences uh, and the report and the work of the Older People's Commissioner, you know, to engage with the Welsh Government as a senior civil servant, but to work with ministers to improve the life chances of people. And I think there's real opportunities. So I think this is a time for change. It's a time for us to be brave and courageous and really think differently. And it's a time actually to change our, our culture um, to enable us all to work together to protect older people and ensure their rights and entitlements are at the forefront of, of everything we do. So I think this has been a, a really great opportunity, you know, to um, inspire and, and actually then, you know, make the right choices and actions and some of the action plan work that I will be, um, you know, leaning on will make sure that we take into account the, the, the learning and the experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Thank you, Rachel. I think, I mean, Albert sort of said what I was going to say about um, this is a time now we are, uh, the report will be, hopefully will propel us forward so that we can see changes. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is, there are support services already here. We, we, we've highlighted some of the, the great ones um, in the yeah. report and um, there are resources the new support service directory that the that, that you the commissioner of hosting we have a knowledge bank we have uh, resources on, on every type of abuse as well as the helpline unfortunately ours is not 24 7 because we don't we're not able to do that we wish we could um 
But I think when we talk about awareness raising and training, I think what's really key is, is, um, is actually what Judy's done today, which is have someone of, who's experienced the abuse to talk about it so openly. Um, these are painful, painful experiences. And I can't imagine how hard it is to, to stand up and, and in front of people and, and tell your, your most vulnerable secrets and your most um, distressing times. But I know that for, for us to really understand and for, for people to come forward, um, we, need to, to, we need people who are as brave as Judy is. Um, and who have that courage to speak about abuse, because that's the only way people really will listen. We can throw out statistics and we can have policies, but the general public and influences respond to those impactful stories. So I think we need to encourage um, people that we work with to, to, to be able to do that. I would completely agree. And I, and I think um, enabling people to share their experiences in a way that, that works for them um, and for people to know that they are then making a massive difference uh, is, is, is vital, really, and, and potentially empowering as well. Judy, your thoughts? I'd like to pick up what Albert said. And I, and I said, when I gave my talk before about accommodation, we need to break away from this idea that the solution to domestic abuse is to remove the person being abused and put them into a refuge. That's, that's fine for some people. I'm not saying we shouldn't have refuges, but it's not the only solution. And, and this whole idea that you have to remove the person who is, you know, I hate the word victim, but who is the victim. Instead of it removing the perpetrator and protecting the victim, which is what happens in some other countries. And also seeing that refuges are, that's what I was told consistently and regularly that I was refusing help because I was refusing to go into a refuge. It wasn't really refusing. It was, that wasn't appropriate. That wasn't what I needed. So Judy. we need to break away from that one solution. So I think re really powerful. And I think break away from one size fits all and one solution. Um, a lot about listening and, and uh, understanding the, the diverse experiences of a diverse older population. Um, and enabling people's voices to be heard. So we're just about at time now. Uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So um, I just want to remind you that you can find the research report uh, on the Older People's Commission of the Wales website, uh, where you can also find the new uh, uh, website, uh, which has all the support services available uh, across Wales, uh, and also the, the leaflet for older people, which we can also send out in hard copy as well. Uh, a number of you are making some additional uh, references uh, in the chat. So Anne's put up the Live Fear Free Helpline. So please do uh, make use of that or contact Anne if you want to find out more. Uh, and of course, uh, both the Live Fear Free Helpline and the Hourglass Cymru Helpline are available today. Uh, should uh, anything that we've covered today uh, mean that you want to seek help or have a conversation. Um, and just a, a final uh, shout out to Rebecca from uh, EROSH, the, the housing network that they are uh, working particularly on good practice on domestic abuse uh, in terms of all the people in, in sheltered housing and elsewhere. So that's really good to hear. So Jock and well, thank you all very much indeed uh, for being with us uh, this morning. Huge thank you to Judy, to Anne, to Rachel, to Albert and to Nicole. Uh, and a big thank you also to my team who've done all the hard work in, in getting ready for this event and, and producing such an excellent report. I do feel we're at a time uh, of change, as, as you have all said. Uh, we've got the evidence now. We've got more voices of older people. It feels to me like we've got a shared commitment to do something in Wales uh, to prevent abuse of older people, but also to make sure that those who are at risk of or experience it can get the help and support they need. So let's lead the way. Uh, let's use today uh, as a platform for further action together. Um, and if you'd like to get involved in that in any way, then please do contact us. So a final thank you uh, from me and um, thanks for being with us today. Jokinvar, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.